Thank you very much for coming tonight. It is a delight to be here. I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, and that is St. Paul. In 2019, Erdman uh, published a book that I co wrote with Brant Petrie and John Kincaid called Paul, a New Covenant Jew. And we were honored to receive a foreword by Michael Gorman, who is probably recognized as one of the foremost experts in Paul in biblical studies. He's a Protestant scholar, actually a Methodist, and yet when they recently produced the Paulist Biblical Commentary, which is published by Paulus Press, which is a Catholic press, uh, the chapter, the introductory chapter on Paul was written by the Protestant Michael Gorman, which I thought was pretty surprising. Uh, and uh, if I had asked Michael Gorman to write a forward and bribe him, I don't think he, I could have got a nicer forward. It was incredible what he, what he did. And so this book has uh, been, uh, thank, I'm very grateful that it's been well received. And uh, just recently, Society of Biblical Literature, which is one of the major scholarly societies, Bible scholars, it, it involves Catholics, but also Protestants of all stripes, uh, I should say Catholics of all stripes. Uh, it also involves atheists, agnostic, Jewish scholars, Muslim scholars, as Muslims study the Bible too, believe it or not. And uh, about a month ago, uh, on the Society of Biblical Literature website, they ran an article by a leading Pauline scholar who engaged our book quite heavily, and that was a lot of fun. We got lots of new emails and invitations to do things because of that. Uh, one of the things we're doing in our book is trying to underscore the Jewishness of St. Paul. Now, the standard way that people are thought about St. Paul is appropriate enough as a convert, right? We have a feast day, the conversion of St. Paul, and certainly Paul turns to the Lord Jesus. He talks about the need to turn to the Lord in 2 Corinthians, which is the root for conversion. Unfortunately, a kind of byproduct of that has been believing somehow that Paul converted away from being Jewish. When we read the New Testament, you see that is flatly false. Okay? Um, now, if you look at biblical scholarship that came out of Germany in the 19th century, you see a lot of anti-Semitism at that time. One of the leading biblical scholars, for example, was Julius Wellhausen, famous for the documentary Hypothesis, and he writes in his commentary on Matthew that we know which material in the Gospels goes back to Jesus, and which material was invented by the early church. He said, we know what is truly of Jesus, it's that which is most, that which is human, and then he adds, what is not Jewish. Think about that for a second. A scholar could say, what is human, that is what is not Jewish. It's really scary. 
And so scholarship, especially in the early in the early part of the 20th century, would downplay Paul's identity as a Jew and try to even sometimes suggest that Paul was actually the real founder of Christianity. That what he did is he projected onto Jesus Greco Roman ideas of divinity and things like that, which then turned Jesus into God. Right? Paul is the real founder of Christianity. This is, I think, nonsense. When we read the book of Acts, we feel like Paul is on trial. And he stands before the Sanhedrin and he says to the Sanhedrin, I am a Pharisee. He doesn't say, I was a Pharisee. He says, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees, and I stand here on trial for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Paul doesn't see himself as a former Jew. He sees himself as a completed Jew. He understands that all that the Jewish scriptures announced are now realized in the coming of the Jewish Messiah, a man from Nazareth who was so much more than man. He was man, but also God, the Lord, kurios, the term that was used to translate God's holy name that was revealed at the burning bush. One of the things that we want to argue in our book is that the more we take seriously Paul's Jewishness, the more Catholic he appears. And so one of the leading scholars in Pauline studies, one of the main scholars who has worked towards recovering Paul's Jewish identity is a man named E.P. Sanders. He wrote a landmark book in 1977 called Paul in Palestinian Judaism. And he argues that Paul should still be understood as a Jew. And most Paul scholars will tell you that Sanders' book that came out in 77 serves as a kind of fault line in the history of scholarship. All scholarship on Paul is still today, in some ways, reacting to and grappling with E.P. Sanders' presentation of Paul. Let me read you a line from E.P. Sanders. He says the following. In reading Paul's letters, he's trying to figure out how to explain Paul's theology. He says, Christians are one person with Christ and participate in him through baptism and the Lord's Supper. E.P. Sanders is a non-confessing Protestant scholar. He doesn't identify himself as religious, but he does identify himself as Protestant. And here you have a Protestant scholar identifying that at the core of Paul is the idea of participation in Christ. And how is that accomplished? In the sacraments. Truly remarkable. He goes on to say, these two Christian rites were taking on a mystical or sacramental meaning. So even E.P. Sanders begins to speak of sacraments in Paul. In fact, the more scholars have been paying attention to Paul, the more they recognize how important ritual is what we might call sacrament, is for understanding the apostle. Mary Douglas, a well-known scholar, writes, the evangelical movement, by which she means Protestant evangelicalism, the evangelical movement has left us with a tendency to suppose that any ritual is empty form. Non-Catholic Christians think, well, if you're using a ritual, that's not really faithful. Real prayer is simply spontaneous. Douglas pushes back against that. The evangelical movement has left us with a tendency to suppose that any ritual is empty form and that any codifying of conduct is alien to natural movements of sympathy and that any external religion betrays 
true interior religion. Scholars now broadly, not just Catholic scholars, are beginning to really grapple with this statement that Douglas, that um, uh, Mary Douglas made way back in the 1960s. Even Protestant scholars are coming to recognize the liturgical aspect of Paul. I want to root that in Paul's overall Jewishness, right? So the first thing I want to talk about is the resurrection of the body in Paul. Now, at first, this may seem like a tangent, but I assure you it is not, right? In Romans chapter 6, Paul says, If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul believes that salvation involves the body. There is a material dimension to salvation. It is not simply spiritual. The body is going to participate in Christ's work of redemption. And perhaps the most striking statement to that effect is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul writes, So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown perishable is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, soma psuchikon in Greek. It is raised a spiritual body, soma pneumatikon. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we will also bear the image of the man from heaven. For the trumpet will sound on the last day, and the judge will and the dead, oh sorry, the dead will be raised imperishable, and watch this. We will be changed. Now I want you to notice that for Paul, being changed is linked to the idea that we will be raised with a spiritual body. Soma pneuma adikon, right? That we will be raised with a spiritual body, not just a perishable body. Now I want you to pay attention to that. That part of Christ's plan of redemption involves material realities that will be changed. Richard Hayes, a leading New Testament scholar, writes, Our mortal bodies embody the psuche, the soul, the animating force of our present existence. But the resurrection body will embody the divinely given pneuma spirit. So there will be a resurrection body, and it will be identified with the divine spirit. Why? Because it will be changed. And one of my favorite passages on this point is also worth mentioning, Philippians 3.21. Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. So, summarize. Christ is going to subject all things to himself, including material realities. And in as much as that is the case, he will transform our physical bodies. Now, here we hear Paul talking like a Jew. If I had time, I'd take you into scriptures like Daniel 12, where we read about the Jewish hope for the resurrection of the body, which will involve a glorification of the body. And it's not just in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We see this in other biblical passages. We even see it in works like First Enoch, which are non-biblical sources. Paul himself talks about 
the renewal of all creation, the redemption of the material world. Elsewhere in Romans 8, he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So point one for tonight. Paul is a Jew who's looking forward to the renewal, the redemption of the material order, which involves our bodies, and that glorification will involve the spirit, the spiritual body, as Paul puts it, that is changed. Okay, now, might this relate to anything else in Paul's thought? Might Paul have understood that redemption of the material world could be related to something else, something that maybe prefigures or anticipates the transformation of creation at the end of time, or better put, the renewal or the redemption of creation at the end of time? I would submit that the answer is yes, and that we can see this in particular in his treatment of the Last Supper and his understanding of the Eucharist. So one of the amazing things about Paul is that all throughout his letters, he talks about Jesus. He even explains that Jesus gives us an example that we should imitate. And yet, in none of his letters does he ever tell us about actual episodes from Jesus' life. We never read about the transfiguration. We never read about the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus is walking on water. We never read about his baptism. We don't read about him giving the Sermon on the Mount, healing the leper, healing the woman with the hemorrhage, with one exception. There's only one episode from Jesus' life that Paul ever narrates in his letters, aside from the crucifixion. There's only one episode from Jesus' public ministry that Paul talks about, and that is the story of the Last Supper. Isn't that amazing? It's the only thing he talks about. Now, this isn't because Paul was unfamiliar with Jesus' life. Hardly. We understand that Paul would have told the people he's writing to, or would have assumed that the people he's writing to, already knew about the life of Christ. That seems pretty obvious from various things he says in his letters. And yet, the only thing Paul reiterates is the story of the Last Supper. Let's take a look at the bottom of the page there on page one. The Lord's Supper and the Sacrifice of the New Covenant. Under the words of institution, Paul writes the following. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. Now that language of receive and handed on, scholars widely recognize this is the language of tradition. Paul uses the verbal word, he used the, 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 the verb paradidomy here. And the verb paradidomy is related to a noun called paradosis, or noun paradosis, which means tradition. And earlier in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul talks about tradition. So scholars widely recognize that when Paul says, I received from the Lord what I handed on to you, he's not talking about having some kind of mystical vision of Jesus where he directly told him the story. No, this is the language of tradition. Okay? So Paul is received from the Lord by means of the rest of the church, probably the apostle Peter and other apostles. He's received this story and he handed this story on that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was handed over, took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, 
you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, when Paul refers to Jesus at the Last Supper, identifying the cup as the new covenant in my blood, it's very clear that Paul and Jesus have a couple of important Old Testament passages in mind. When Jesus is at the Last Supper, and he takes the cup and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood, there are very clearly two passages in the backdrop. This is widely accepted among scholars. Okay? The first one that we could talk about is the passage, and I mean the passage, as in the only one, the only passage in the Bible that refers to a new covenant. We find it in the book of Jeremiah. The prophet says, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. This is it, folks. This is the only passage in the, in the scriptures of Israel that talks about a new covenant. And so when Jesus says the words new covenant over the chalice, over the cup at the Last Supper, we know he has Jeremiah 31 on his mind. Right? Every time we go to Mass and we hear the words of institution, Jeremiah is in the backdrop. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke. You know that story, the sin of the golden calf. Though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Jesus is talking about the new covenant. He's talking about that hope. That one day the sins would be forgiven. Jesus' blood is identified with the new covenant. But what's really interesting, there's more. When you establish a covenant, you typically do so through sacrifice. How do we know that? The Bible says so. <laughs> if you look at the Psalms, I'll give you an example. Psalm 50. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And in fact, this is what happens in the book of Exodus. When Israel enters into a covenant with God, how do they do it? They're a sacrifice, right? They cut a covenant as they would say in Hebrew, karat, cut a covenant, right? And so in the book of Exodus, we read the story of how the Israelites established, everybody knows Israel had a covenant with God. When did that happen? At Mount Sinai. Here's the moment it happened. We read, Moses sent young men of the people who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed oxen as offerings of well-being to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people. Did you catch that? I hope they weren't wearing white that day. Right? Moses threw the blood on the people. Yuck! What's going on here? All right, so what is going on is the people are entering into a covenant by swearing an oath. All that the Lord has commanded, we will do. All right? And what they do is they kill animals in part to symbolize what will happen to them if they fail to keep the covenant. There are high stakes here. And then Moses takes some of the blood and he puts it on the altar. Why? Because the altar symbolizes God. And then he puts some of the blood and he puts it on the people. This indicates that God and his people share a blood bond. They're family. This is why God calls Israel my people. Right? To say someone is my people is essentially to say they're my family. So Israel is entering into a covenant with God and they've enacted 
what the covenant curses would be if they break the covenant. Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people, and what does he say? Behold, the blood of the covenant. How do you establish a covenant in blood? Cut the covenant. What is Jesus indicating at the Last Supper when he says, "This is the cup of my. This is the, the this cup is is the new covenant in my blood." What is he saying? He is the sacrifice. Now, just for a second, I want you to think about this. We're so used to using the word sacrifice to describe something that's selfless. We miss the significance of this. For ancient Jews, sacrifices were animals that were offered. Here Jesus is describing himself, his death as a sacrifice. Which, by the way, also means that Jesus is a priest. Because who is it that offers the sacrifice? It's the priest who sacrifices the sacrifice. The Israelites would bring their sacrifices to the temple, but it's the priest who offers the sacrifice, technically. Jesus is priest and victim. And then after they do this, we read Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet, there was something like a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. Also, they beheld God, and they ate and drank. So what? What do you do when you enter into covenant? You have, you have a meal. Typically, this would happen when people would enter into covenants with one another. They would have a meal. You see this with Abraham and Abimelech in the book of Genesis. Well, the same thing is happening here in Exodus. But the covenant is made with God. So the people have a heavenly meal. The, the covenant, the blood of the covenant, creates a bond that initiates a communion, a covenant communion that is instantiated, that is expressed in a meal. Now, all of this is really significant, right? Jesus is drawing on all of this at the Last Supper, according to Paul. And by the way, scholars generally agree, Paul's letters are among the earliest New Testament works. So here we have the earliest Christian writer explaining the significance of the Last Supper, right? And using all of this biblical background to explain it. Jesus is the sacrifice of a new covenant, the one that Jeremiah foretold, that brings about the forgiveness of sins. Why is a new covenant needed, according to Jeremiah? Because Israel broke the covenant. But what happens if you break a covenant? <laughs> you are under the penalty of death. What does Jesus do? He bears the punishment. He takes on the punishment himself in dying on the cross and thereby triggers the new covenant relationship. He offers himself as the blood of the sacrifice. He offers his own blood. And that enables us to have a heavenly meal with God, which we find in the Last Supper narrative. And I'm going to flush out how we know Paul means all this. First of all, Paul identifies Jesus as an atoning sacrifice. In Romans 3, Paul says, They are now justified by his grace as a gift, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood. Jesus is the sacrifice of atonement. One of the key sacrifices of atonement in the book of Leviticus is known as the sin offering. Paul calls Jesus a sin offering in Romans, for example, and also in 2 Corinthians 3. I'll just pick one. In Romans 8, Paul says, For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as a sin offering. The Greek word there for sin offering is peri 
hamartias. That's the same Greek construction that's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament to translate the sin offering. Paul is describing Jesus as the sin offering. What do you do with the sin offering? We read about that in Leviticus chapter 5. Leviticus chapter 5 says, But if you cannot afford two turtle doves or a partridge in the pear tree. Oh, no, sorry. That's a, that's a song. If you cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, you shall bring as your offering for the sin, or your sin offering, one-tenth of an ephah of choice of flour for a sin offering. Notice the Greek there. Very hamartias. That's what it says in the Greek version of the Old Testament. You shall not put oil on it or lay frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering. In other words, you can't put fancy stuff on a sin offering. That's not very penitential. Right? That's what Thomas Aquinas says. Thus the priest shall make atonement on your behalf for whichever these sins you've committed, and you shall be forgiven. And like the grain offering, the rest will be for the priest. In other words, the priest is supposed to eat some of the sin offering. Priests eat the sin offering. Why? In Leviticus chapter 10, we read why. Moses gets mad at Aaron for not eating the sin offering. He says, why did you not eat the sin offering in the sacred area? For it is a most holy. Notice that. The most holy thing in the tabernacle, in the tent of meeting, the most holy thing is what? The sin, off that, the sin offering that you eat. It's one of the most holy things. One of the most holy things is the meal the priests eat. And you do this, why? To remove the guilt of the congregation to make atonement. In other words, part of the sacrifice, part of the atoning ritual is you have to eat the meal. If the priests don't eat the meal, then atonement hasn't been effected. What does Jesus say we should do with his body again? Jesus is a sacrifice, and Jesus identifies himself with bread, and he identifies himself not just as the sacrifice, the blood of the new covenant, he also identifies himself as an edible sacrifice. Well, that's exactly what you would expect if Jesus is a sin offering, right? Because you eat the sin offering. Now, in the Old Testament, the only people who can eat the sin offering are priests, in the new covenant, we are all priests by virtue of our baptism. We don't belong to the ministerial priesthood, but we are called to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, as 1 Peter says. Jesus also does something else that's interesting. So my non-Catholic Christian friends and non-Catholic Christian scholars in the academy will say, yes, of course, there's sacrificial imagery. Jesus is the sacrifice, but the mass is not a sacrifice. The Eucharist is not a sacrifice. The sacrifice happens on Calvary. But if Jesus is the sin offering, the meal is part of the sacrifice. The meal itself is a sacrificial offering. Moreover, we read in the institution narrative, Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Now that phrase remembrance in the Greek is anamnesis. Anamnesis is the Greek word. And it's the same word that is used for sacrifices in the Levitical cult, in the tabernacle. Numbers 10.10 10 explains that burnt offerings are a remembrance, an anamnesis. My favorite example, though, turn to page three of your handout, my favorite example of this, however, is a little-known sacrifice in the Old Testament known as the bread of the presence, the lehem ha-panin in the Old Testament. The Lord said to Moses, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil from beaten olives for the lamp, that a light may be kept burnt continually. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes of it. Uh, two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. And you shall set them in two rows, six in a row, upon the table of pure gold. 
And you shall put pure frankincense. What's frankincense? It's just incense. It's honest incense. Just kidding. No, it's frankincense. It's, in, it's just incense, right? You shall put incense with each row that it may go with the bread as a anamnesis. This is the same word Jesus uses at the Last Supper. To be offered by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, Aaron shall set it in order before the Lord continually on behalf of the people as a covenant forever. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. Catholics, I know this is so bizarre, the Old Testament. It just seems so foreign to us. You've never seen a priest put holy bread on an altar, on a table, and offer it with incense. That's what we do with the Eucharist. Why do we do that with the Eucharist? Why do we do what the priests do in the Old Testament with the bread of the presence? Where's the bread of the presence? Before the lampstand, before the light, before the lamp, continually. The lampstand is a menorah, right? You always see it around Hanukkah, the seven-branched menorah. That's in the tabernacle. It's on the north side. Uh, the, no, I'm sorry. The lampstand's on the south side. The bread of the presence on the north side. If you walk between those two things, you'll go into the Holy of Holies. The two holiest objects on the other side of the Holy of Holies. You have to keep holy bread on a table with a candle that's always lit. And you offer it with incense. And it's offered as a remembrance, as a anamnesis, and as a covenant. And if we were to keep reading the book of Numbers, you'd see that the bread of the presence is also offered with wine. And when the priests take it out of the tabernacle, they have to put a veil over it. Why do Catholics put a veil over the Eucharist? Why do we have a candle that's always lit? Because the bread of the presence is understood to point forward to the Eucharist. The Eucharist is offered as a covenant, as the new covenant, and as a memorial, holy bread. Now we can also see that Jesus is the Passover lamb. We see that in 1 Corinthians 5. And Paul says, for, Christ, for our Paschal lamb Christ, our Passover lamb Christ, has been sacrificed, therefore let us celebrate the feast. See, when you celebrate Passover, you have to kill the lamb, right? Remember the story? The angel of death is going through the land. The Israelites have to do three things. They have to kill the lamb. They have to spill its blood and put its blood on their doorpost. And then they have to say a prayer to the Lord God as their personal Lord and Savior, and then they just go to bed. No. I like to say there are three things involved with the Passover lamb. Kill spill, and eat your fill. You got to eat the lamb. And so if Jesus is the Passover lamb, part of that sacrifice involves what? Us eating him. Now, in 1 Corinthians 10, before Paul talks about the Last Supper, Paul does what he often does in his letters. He sets the table, sorry, I couldn't resist the pun, for what he will talk about later. And so there are already Eucharistic allusions in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul says, what do I imply? That food sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants Koinonus, that's the nominal form of the word communion, koinonia. I don't want you to be communicants, we could say, with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord, what is that a reference to? The Eucharist. And the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. 
What is Paul talking about? The Eucharist. But did you just notice what he called the Eucharist? The table of the Lord. He refers to the Eucharist as the table of the Lord. Interesting. There are lots of people who uh, can confuse you and mislead you. If you want to get good theology, don't go to YouTube. Okay. And there are some crackpots on YouTube who make outrageous claims like the Second Vatican Council tried to downplay the sacrificial dimension of the Mass. Before the Second Vatican Council, of the Mass was all about sacrifice. After the words, it's just about a, a meal. That's absurd. You know, in the Mass after Vatican II, the people actually call the Mass a sacrifice. We all have to say it. We say, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hand. Before Vatican II, there was no prayer in the Mass where the people were forced to call the Mass a sacrifice. If you want to play down the sacrifice of the Mass, you don't add prayers that call it a sacrifice. And people will say, well, it's because in the Novus Ordo and then in the Mass after Vatican II, they call the Mass, they refer to the Eucharist as a table. That just means it's a meal. No. Where do we get the idea that the Eucharist is the table of the Lord? From St. Paul. St. Paul calls it the table of the Lord. And it's very significant that he does so. There's a famous prophecy in the book of Malachi. Where Malachi says this. This is on your handout. Oh, that someone among you would shut the temple doors so that you would not kindle fire on my altar in vain. These people are profaning the altar. God says, I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts. I will not accept an offering from your hands, a sacrificial offering. Talking about the altar and sacrifice. Then he says, for from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations, among the pagans, among the Gentiles, I should say. And in every place, incense is offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Now, scholars will rightly point out, this is a shocking passage for ancient Jews. Because according to Deuteronomy, there's only one place where you're allowed to offer sacrifice. What? Ultimately, right? So in Deuteronomy 12, it says, the Lord will show you a place. And it's the one place you can offer sacrifice. But Malachi says, no, Gentiles are offering acceptable sacrifices to God all over the world. The early church fathers, and even some scholars today, recognize this is a prophecy. This is a prophecy of a future day when right sacrifices will be offered in Gentile lands. When does that happen? You can read the Didache, very early Christian document. It goes about, go back to about the year 110. And then just about every early church father will tell you that this is a passage about the Eucharist. I want you to look around the room right now. Look around. See all of us here? Okay. How many of you went to Mass today? How many went to Mass this week? We are on the other side of the world from where Israel is. If you were to go back in a flying DeLorean with Doc Brown to the time of ancient Israel and tell the people, now someday all the nations will worship one of the gods of these people. They would have guessed the Babylonians, the biggest empire at the time. Or maybe the Egyptians, huge empire. Maybe Assyria. Not long ago, let me we'll go off script for a second. Not long ago, uh, I was at my house. We had a, a plumbing problem. We called a plumber. He shows up, starts working. And he says, so do you mind me asking what you do for a living, sir? I said, oh, I'm a Bible scholar. He said, you're kidding me. 
He said, you know, I've recently felt that I need to go to church. But I'm not sure that Christianity is necessarily the right religion. How do I know which one is the right religion? And so I used an argument that Eusebius used a long time ago in his book on the preparation of the gospel, and it's picked up by others like Ambrose and Augustine. It goes something like this. I said to him, hmm. He said, do you know, uh, what other religions do you know? He said, well, there are all kinds. Of I said, well, have you met any Egyptians? He said, well, I'm not sure. I said, well, do you worship, do you know anybody who worships the god Ray? Said, oh, no. I said, yeah, they don't really worship Ray anymore. That's an old Egyptian religion. I said, how about Marduk? Have you considered Marduk? as an option for your God. He said, uh, I don't even know who that is. And I said, oh, he was the God of the Babylonians. He said, oh, and I said, the Chaldeans worshiped him. I said, have you ever considered Molech as an option? You probably don't want that one because you have to sacrifice your children to him. He said, no, I don't know Molech. I said, that's a good thing, trust me. He was the God of the Canaanites. I said, oh said, have you ever heard of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, that one I know. He said with a smile. He said, yeah, here's the crazy thing. In the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are worshipped by this tiny little people on a land that's no bigger than New Jersey. And this little people believe that one day all the world would worship their one God. That the nations would say, you know what, your God is better than our God. And that the nations would convert and worship the God of Abraham. And now all over the world, that's happening. In fact, just this morning, I was at a service where with a bunch of other non-Israelites from peoples who have no connection to the people of Israel, whose families come from Europe and Asia and all over the world, Africa, we all gathered to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel, just as the prophets predicted. He said, wow, I never thought about it like that. He said, well, Muslims, they worship the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob too, right? And I said, yes, but you know, most of the early Christian writers who saw Islam emerge explained that Islam is basically a variation of Arianism, which was a Christian heresy. So really, Muslims worship the God of Abraham because they got that from Christianity. So because of the coming of Jesus now, people all over the world worship the God of Abraham. He said, I never thought about it that, that way before. Long before the coming of Jesus, Malachi said that a pure offering would be made among the nations in every place. It would be offered to my name, a sacrifice. And that's what happened this morning. Far away from Israel, a pure offering was made in Atchison, Kansas to the Lord. That's a fulfillment of the prophecy. And the prophet goes on to say, but you profane the altar when you say that the table of the Lord. What is the table of the Lord? The altar. Well, when you call it the table of the Eucharist, you're denying the sacrificial dimension of the mass. No, you're not. Because the early church has always understood, and the church has always understood the Eucharist to be a fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy, which calls the altar the table of the Lord. And so did Paul. In 1 Corinthians, Paul calls the Eucharist the table of the Lord, the very phrase Malachi used to describe the altar. In other words, Paul is describing the Eucharist as the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. And if you think I'm reading too much into that line, let me show you how 1 Corinthians begins. 
Paul sets the table. He says, those who in every place, and Ponti Tapo, call on the name Ha Anama of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the exact same phrase that's used in Malachi. Look on the other side of the handout. In every place, in Pati Tapo, incense is offered to my name. And so Paul is not coincidentally calling the Eucharist the table of the Lord. It's on the altar of the Lord on the Eucharist table, on the Eucharistic table that Paul is telling the Corinthians they're fulfilling the prophecy of Malachi. Now, this little detail has attracted a lot of attention from Protestant scholars who read our book, who now recognize that you can't say that for Paul, the sacrifice only takes place on the cross. The Eucharistic table is the, Euchar is the altar. So finally, the third point. The first point is the material world is taken up in Christ's work of redemption especially as our bodies are changed. The second point is that very clearly when Jesus institutes the Eucharist, he understands the Eucharistic elements themselves to be part of his work of redemption. It's not just his death on the cross, it's the Eucharistic elements themselves. And so part three, the Eucharist itself is what affects communion with Christ. Take a look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because, Hati, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. Did you catch that? The one bread is what makes us one body. It's not the other way around. It's not because we are one body. Let's just use one bread as a symbol of us being one body. No, the one bread is what turns us into one body. In other words, the Eucharist doesn't just symbolize communion. It affects our communion. Paul believes the Eucharistic elements themselves are part of the work of redemption. It's not just a symbol. The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Because we all partake of the one bread, we are one body. And so Paul goes on to say at the beginning of, the, of that chapter, he says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. What is that a reference to? The Exodus. When Israel is led out of Egypt by the cloud, the glory of the Lord, and all pass through the sea. What is that a reference to? The Exodus, the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds, right? Where the Israelites go through the waters. And all were baptized in the Moses. Wait a minute, I don't remember Moses standing out there with the seashell baptizing people. No, he didn't. The word baptism is never used to describe the, the, the waters of the Red Sea and the Septuagint. Paul is using the language of the sacrament to describe an Old Testament story. He sees the Old Testament story as foreshadowing of baptism. And then he says, and all ate the same spiritual food. Pneumaticon broma. Spiritual food. That's the same language Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 to describe the resurrected body. Remember that? It's a spiritual body. Remember we talked about that at the beginning? And what does Paul say about the spiritual body? It has been changed. The body is changed. So if Paul is not talking about the fact that Moses and the Israelites were baptized, and Moses and the Israelites received spiritual food, and they drank spiritual drink. He goes on to say, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. So the rock in the Old Testament that the water came forth from is actually an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. 
Christ is the quote-unquote spiritual rock. And then he says, nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. If you know the book of Exodus, you know that to be the case, right? They rebelled and they were struck down in the wilderness. And then Paul says these momentous things. He is this momentous thing. He says, now these things occurred as examples for us. The Greek word there translated examples is tupoi, types. Ever heard of typology? Old Testament types? We get that idea from St. Paul and from this particular passage. Henri de Lubac did such great work here as your professor has shared with the world in his great translation of medieval exegesis where the church fathers and doctors understood that the Old Testament realities are foreshadowings or types of the new covenant and they get that from St. Paul who explicitly calls these things two-point types. These things occurred as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Now, I just want to explain. Richard Hayes, leading Protestant scholar, says, just as the Corinthians received spiritual food and drink at the Last Supper, so also the Israelites were given spiritual food and spiritual drink. When Paul talks about spiritual food, he's talking about the manna, spiritual drink, the water from the rock, he sees that as a foreshadowing of the Eucharist. And then he makes a striking statement. These things are examples for us. In what way? Can you believe what the Israelites did? They received manna. The manna is called in the Psalms, panis angelicus. That's what the manna is called in the Latin Vulgate. The bread of angels. The Israelites received bread of angels. And then they turned against God and sinned. Can you imagine receiving the bread of angels and then being so ungrateful that you would sin? Paul says this happened as a warning for us. Does Paul think the Eucharist is just a symbol? Not a chance. It's, not, it's greater. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. The old covenant involved eating the bread of angels. What is it that we receive in the new covenant? The bread of the presence par excellence. The bread of the real presence of Christ. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 12, Paul says, Just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Now, some people think that's a reference to baptism, but as we argue in our book, it's more likely a reference to the Eucharist. We drink of the Spirit in the Eucharist. What is the, what is the Eucharist? Spiritual food. The man, just like the Red Sea is baptism, the manna is spiritual food. That's meant to symbolize the Eucharist. And what happens to spiritual bodies? They're changed, according to St. Paul. What happens to spiritual food? It's food that has been changed. Colin Miller, a Protestant biblical scholar, says, the Eucharistic meal, now he gets this all from reading Paul carefully, not from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. The Eucharistic meal consists of pneumatic, that means of the spirit, pneumatic bread and pneumatic cup. Greek word for spirit is pneuma. Because Christ's resurrected body is pneumatic, of the spirit, and the meal is for consumption of and communion with Christ himself. This is my body. In a physical sense, then, the church materially participates in Christ's pneumatic body through the Lord's Supper. And then he quotes 1 Corinthians 6. But he who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Paul is a Eucharistic theologian. 
the church's theology of the Eucharist is not based on Thomas Aquinas. He helps us understand what divine revelation has made known to us. But we don't get this simply from reading Augustine or Jerome or Origen. Theology is not theologianology. We don't have the Catholic faith because we look to all these really smart people in history who had some good ideas, and we think their opinions are right. No. What we believe is ultimately taught in divinely revealed scripture. I love Augustine, we'll never read him at Mass instead of St. Paul. I love Aquinas, we'll never read Aquinas at Mass instead of St. Paul. I love Therese of Lisieux or Teresa of Avila, we'll never read them at Mass instead of St. Paul. Because we can't read their works and then say, the word of the Lord. That is reserved for inspired scripture. Do you want to know where the Catholic Church gets its theology? Thomas Aquinas says, in Paul's letters, we find virtually the whole of Catholic theology. Catholic theology is simply trying to preserve and understand what it is St. Paul taught. One, Catholic theology teaches a doctrine called the real presence. What is present in the Eucharist? Not just a symbol. Something greater than the bread of the Old Testament presence. As holy as that was, we have something even greater. Something greater than the bread of angels. What we have is, this is my body. We have Christ's body, which makes us one body. Secondly, another Catholic doctrine. The real presence tells us what is in the Eucharist. The second doctrine tells us how. It's called transubstantiation. What do we believe? That the bread and wine are converted. Some people say transformed, but that's actually wrong because they stayed the same form. They still look like bread and wine. As Reinhard Hüter rightly points out, the best word is transubstantiation. The bread and the wine are transubstantiated. Where do we get that? What does Paul say about spiritual bodies? They've been changed. So what is it true about spiritual food? It's been changed in some way. When Jesus says, this is my body, he's not just talking symbolically. He means, <clears throat> this is complicated. This is what he means. This is my body. <laughs> we take him at his word. All right. There are a number of other things I could say. I was going to talk about how ancient Israelites looked forward to the day God would restore Israel in a new temple. We're going to look at some passages, talk about the restoration of Israel at a temple. St. Paul explains that the church is that temple. You can read those passages later. But the point is, many Protestant scholars... Many biblical scholars, even some Catholic scholars, sadly, have imagined that Paul and the New Testament authors are adverse to ritual, to cultic worship. Nothing could be further from the truth. The temple foreshadows what we have in the Eucharistic celebration of the new covenant that Jesus announced, not on the fields of Galilee, not in the halls of the temple, but over the cup. And in the Eucharistic celebration, we receive the edible sacrifice, the sacrificial meal of the new covenant, the covenant that makes us God's family through Christ's blood. We eat that sacrifice and are so united to Christ and become one body with him so that what? We too can be changed.
And the way that happens is just as Christ is sacrificed, we offer ourselves with him in sacrifice. We join in. We are united to the sacrifice so that we can share in his glory. May the Lord accept a sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his holy church. This is what we pray. We ask to be part of that sacrifice and offer ourselves up to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. St. Paul, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. I'm here from the Augustine Institute. I've been talking to various classes this week about the Augustine Institute. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we, we have, we have a number of excellent graduate programs. We've attracted some of the top flight scholars uh, in, in the world, really, in the last few years. The Augustine Institute has exploded in the last few years. We've attracted people like Brant Petrie, a New Testament scholar many of you may know of, or Jim Prothro, James Prothro, uh, a student uh, from Simon Gathercole's program at Cambridge University who wrote a very well-received uh, doctoral dissertation on justification. And in the last three years, I think he's published three new books on Paul and justification. Uh, the latest one is through Catholic University of America. Elizabeth Klein, who is a world-class Augustine scholar, got her PhD at Notre Dame, wrote a book on Augustine's Theology of the Angels. It's published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, I got a new book coming out with Cambridge University Press as well. We've just hired another new scholar, Israel McGrew, who is the Emerging Scholar of the Year from Catholic Biblical Association. His book is coming out through Cambridge University Press as well. Um, and uh, another scholar, Chris Mooney, expert on Augustine. His book is coming out through Oxford University Press. And we're just continuing to grow. And the reason for that is our, under, our, our, our theology programs we currently have are exploding. We have one in pastoral theology. Uh, it'll train you to work in the church. If you want to be a catechist, if you want to work for a bishop in a diocese, we know a lot about that. Uh, we have a platform you may have heard of called Formed, form.org. It's now showing the chosen. We have uh, entered into agreement with the, the chosen to be the Catholic um, source for the chosen, and um, over a million people. We have more people on Formed than people watch CNN every day. And uh, bishops all over the world get it for their entire diocese. And so when the bishops need to hire somebody new in their diocese and offices, those bishops usually call us and say, do you have any students that are graduating that might be good for my positions? So it's a great place to get connected with the church in America and really elsewhere. We also have a master's degree in theology. It's just a straight master's degree in theology. It's available on campus and online. But the thing I'm most excited about, more than anything else, is a new degree called a Master's of Arts in Biblical Studies. We're looking for four to six students who will be accepted to this program. There are scholarships available for all of our programs, including this one. But some of the students that get it, uh, accepted to this program may also, well, some will, get a stipend, which means you don't have to work. Get a stipend to study so that you don't have to have a job. You can just focus on reading for 50 hours a week, uh, which is what it's going to take if you're serious about being a Bible scholar. PhD programs, the top PhD programs, the ones that produce people that get hired, Right? We're, we're looking for new theologians this year again. We're going to hire seven new people in two years. And not because people have left. We're just expanding. And we have like 80 applicants. And they all have PhDs. Right? It's really hard to find jobs. And the ones that get hired come from the top tier programs. And we want to mentor you to help you become a Bible scholar. We want to take you to Society of Biblical Literature. We want to teach you how to write academic papers. 
We want to make sure you have the biblical languages. We want to mentor you, not so that you're one of 100 students or 200 students, but in this program you get one-on-one -on -one seminars. This Master's in Biblical Studies launches next year. Uh, we're already getting lots of applications, but uh, I want to encourage you to think about it. Uh, Leo the Thirteenth and his great letter Providentissimus Deus on the promotion of sacred scripture study talks about all of the difficulties people have with scripture. How many people are confused by modernists who say that the miracles of scripture didn't really happen? And he points out many people are losing their faith because they don't know the scriptures. And then he asks, where are the champions for so momentous a battle? Maybe God is calling you to be one of the champions in this momentous battle. Joseph Ratzinger said in 1988 in a famous lecture that raising up a generation of scholars, or raising up scholars who fully understand the teaching of Vatican II on scripture study he said, that's going to be the work of a generation. We think this is the generation. We want to raise up those scholars. So if you're interested, I'll be around. I'd love to talk to you about the program and the offerings that we have. Of course, we have other great programs as well. If reading 50 hours a week doesn't seem like a lot of fun for you, but you still really want to pursue theology, we have lots of other great programs that will train you to be a catechist, train you to be a teacher, or a religious educator, um, not necessarily a full-time scholar who learns German, right? Uh, but uh, hopefully there's something there for you. I want to thank you so much for having me in a particular way. I want to thank Dr. Swafford. Thank you so much for hosting me this week and for being willing to have me. When they asked me at the AI, where would you like to go? They said, we can send you anywhere, talk about our degree programs, what, what schools do you think you should go to? I said, number one, Benedictine College, because I think you guys are getting amazing formation. I'm watching it from a distance and everything your president is doing. And one of my closest friends is a professor here, and you are very blessed to study with him. So I want to thank you very much, Andy, for bringing me out here. Thank you, all you students, for being so kind and generous. I'll be around if you have any questions. Thank you very much. May God bless you in your studies.